Hello and welcome. I'm Shane McLeod here at the Lowy Institute in Sydney. Thanks for joining this Oz PNG Network live event. I'd like to at the start acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm coming to you from. That's the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And we pay our respects and acknowledge those traditional owners and their leaders past, present and emerging. Well, here at the AusPNG Network, we are all about connecting Papua New Guinea and Australia, something that has been a little tricky, I think we can all admit, over the past 12 months. But it's something that we hope through events like this one, we can keep up those connections. There's been so much going on. I mean, can you believe we're already at February 2021? So lots to catch up on. I'm very fortunate to have with me today a panel who can help us talk through some of the issues that have been going on in PNG over the last little bit, but also looking forward to what the events might be to watch in the coming year. So let me introduce them first. First up in the Post Korea newsroom today is Rebecca Cuckoo, who is a journalist, both a freelancer and frequent contributor to both the Post Korea and Guardian Australia. Hello to you, Rebecca. Hi, hi everyone. <laughs> also joining us from Port Moresby is the Deputy Director of Policy and Advocacy at Transparency International PNG, Yuan Bari Hai Hui. G'day, Yuan Bari. We know you're there, Yuan Bari. We're just having a little technical issue switching to you. So I'll go to my third panelist, which is Patrick Kaiku, who is a political science lecturer at the University of Papua New Guinea. Good afternoon to you, Patrick. Good afternoon, audience. Good afternoon, Shane. It's Thank great you. to have the three of you joining us via Zoom from Port Moresby. We've uh, fingers, Shane, crossed, fingers crossed the technology is going to be kind to us. Um, for you watching at home or at your office or at your desk or on your mobile phone, um, stick with us. If we have some technical issues, we'll do our best to get back on track. Um, but look, there is so much to talk about. There's been plenty going on in politics, plenty going on in the economy. Um, we might talk politics just first up, just so we can really recap what happened in the last couple of months of last year. Rebecca, I might come to you first. I mean, that was a crazy period, about six weeks from November through till basically Christmas in politics. Yeah. Prime Minister Marape, very, very close to being bundled out of office. What was it that really brought it all on? Um, I think, um, so yeah, let me just straight up say first, um, a disclaimer, anything that I say does not represent the view of um, the postcard or the Guardian. So yeah, I, I personally think that the catalyst for the political turmoil that happened at the end of last year was due to the case that was before the Supreme Court questioning the validity of the Prime Minister um, James Marapa's appointment. So we basically saw a lot of um, party leaders, you know, everyone wanted to be prime minister and they thought, you know, there was a chance for it because the prime minister's case was before the Supreme Court and it just went crazy. And then people were going back and forth, back and forth, it went on. And then um, when the PM's case came through and he was, um, when the case was thrown out, we saw a lot of um, MPs just crossing back again. It suddenly all started happening, didn't it? Patrick, I know you wrote about this, this sort of legalistic trend that has been an increasingly big factor in, in politics in PNG. What do you think is going on? Why are the courts having to get involved so much in these cases? I, I would say basically that uh, lawmakers really are still unsure about their roles and responsibilities and the powers and what they're supposed to be guarding in terms of their independence. Uh, the constitution was written at a time when most Papua New Guineans were still not educated, literate, knowledgeable about the mechanics of a modern democratic system. And therefore the courts was given, <coughs> given more leverage and uh, interventionist kind of uh, in, uh, role to in, interpret uh, uh, vague areas of the constitution or so they basically were given the task of social engineering and I think Balkama, Dr. Balkama talks about this. The idea was that with time and maturity of a certain period of time, Papua New Guineans and especially institutions like parliament would now be more knowledgeable about their powers and be more independent and stop relying too much on the courts. Uh, but that has not been the case. Uh, parliament is still a very uh, uh, 
still not institutionalized as it should be, knowledgeable about the roles and uh, performing that uh, political modernization function that they're supposed to do. So uh, it's also to do with the political party system and it's a whole system kind of way of looking at how political modernization is not working. So uh, parliamentarians naturally don't know their roles and responsibilities and therefore contracting out the role of uh, interpreting standing orders and the various provisions in the constitution. It's um, something I need to talk to you a bit more about because I think there's some really interesting aspects to how it was all resolved in the end. But I'll, I'll just jump across to Yuan Bari. Yuan Bari, this all happened pretty much the day after Parliament passed the new ICAC laws. Is that a big factor in this? Do you think the, the push for new anti-corruption laws is um, becoming an issue that um, political leaders are finding themselves they want to engage in? Yeah, so as, as uh, Patrick's alluded to, the things uh, that allow for the parliamentary process for debate or bills and legislation is um, has, I guess, eroded over time. So it's always difficult to draw this cause and effect in terms of legislation. Um, I think just for the viewers, it was on the 12th that the bill was passed unanimously by 96 members of parliament. And then exactly the, the next day, which was a Friday, um, the, the, the move to the opposition happened and the, the mini constitutional crisis that happened uh, towards the end of last year. Um, I, I think speaking at an institution like Lowy, uh, you can also look at the regional trends and um, uh, viewers might know about the Solomon Islands and the case around their own um, independent commission against corruption and the political upheaval that came from that. So um, it, it would be uh, uh, a reasonable conclusion to draw um, that the ICAC might have played into the, the, the wheeling and dealing of politics. Um, but as uh, Patrick alluded to, there's always so many different factors, whether that has to do with the power grabs um, within uh, different political factions, or in fact, you know, just basic strategizing for the 2022 national elections. Um, I, I will say though that it's interesting to see, uh, following the fallout of that, that both the prime minister and his former deputy prime minister was also the former attorney general trying to claim credit for the ICAC. Um, so it might have been um, a, a factor, but more people trying to uh, ascribe themselves as being the anti-corruption faction in government. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you think it's something that we're likely to see more of a focus on heading towards the elections in 2022? Will will people want to be seen to be aligning themselves with that anti-corruption um, policy? Yeah, it definitely seems to be um, one of the cards that particularly new members of parliament um, use as coming in as reformers. Um, it, one only needs to look at the new member for Medang, uh, Brian Prim and his platform, but also uh, parliamentarians like uh, Gary Jufa, Alan Bird, um, have, have campaigned uh, in, the, in the electorates, particularly on the anti-corruption and governance platform. Um, it's something obviously uh, TIPNG, Transparency National Public Meeting, would like to see more um, candidates doing, but also I, I know Mr. Kaiku is a very much aware of the electoral trends and um, you often have uh, the incumbent um, very much trying to protect status quo and the challenge is always claiming to be anti-corruption fighters um, prior to entering office. So uh, not to be too cynical, but it's always uh, people standing for uh, seats in parliament that are new first time people always come in with an anti-corruption agenda. And it's up to people of goodwill to then utilize that opportunity to engage with them um, if they do it, happen to attain power. All right, so back to you then, Patrick. I mean, the resolution of this, there were a lot of court cases. There was a lot of back and forth between the speaker, uh, the, the chief justice, um, the, the prime minister. Has it been resolved? I mean, do you feel that the legal issues have been sorted out and the status of parliament, which seems to have been what the real questions were about the legality and the status of some of those parliamentary hearings. Have we seen the end of that and things have quietened down there? I would think the major winner out of all this was uh, James Marapis. So just by the defection that happened, he got, being a first time prime minister, he actually got a sense of who to trust and who to work with and consolidate his power base, giving ministries and rewarding those who are loyal to him. Uh, within that, that, so the parliamentary dynamics of it, as I see it, is resolved. Uh, I would not want to comment on the constitutionality or otherwise of, uh, because I've not, reading, uh, you know, Parliamentarians who submit uh, cases before the before the Supreme Court for interpretation usually there is a, a way of it's a way of trying to delay, you know, the, and the next move by the, the opposition or you know. So it's uh, sometimes some of these cases are basically trivial matters, a privileged use of the Supreme Court just to stall time and to you know win uh, 
you know, uh, support from undecided uh, members who are moving back and forth. So I, I just, I, I'll just leave it at that uh, maybe members of the audience who are more knowledgeable about uh, you know, the constitutionality or whether it's stopped. <laughs> That's an excellent segue for me. Thanks, Patrick. So I should mention to people, we will have a great opportunity for you to ask a question during our event today. About half past the hour, um, we'll start taking some of your questions. If you've got one you'd like to submit at the bottom of your screen on your device or on your computer, there's a Q&A button. If you type your question in there, my colleague Jonathan Pryke is going to help us pick some of those questions out and we'll be able to put them to our panel a little later in the event. So do get busy there if you've got something you'd like to ask. Rebecca, can I come back to you? There was so much going on in politics and things have calmed down. Um, what, what is the prognosis for the Prime Minister now? I, I know he's talked about Parliament will sit in April. Is there an expectation that instability has gone away? Um, in PNG politics, um, it's the land of the unexpected. Anything can happen. And from April, um, when Parliament sits again, there's a window open for the ONC from April to June. So I can't really say um, because you you just can't be sure when it comes to PNG politics. I think that's a fair enough answer um, and probably a good point for us to step away to something else now. And I know you, through your blog and through your work as a journalist, have reported extensively on gender-based violence um, and there's been a terrible situation in Hela over the last couple of weeks. A large number of people who were killed in clashes between various groups there. Um, for those of us watching from afar, what, what's changed and what, what's going on that these substantial violent situations seem to keep happening and they seem to be a really big factor in that part of the highlands where those big resource projects are a big factor as well. What, what's your sense of what's driving it? Um, I think it's a cultural thing. It's been there for years. It's, it's a normal practice for them. Um, I think the main thing now is information and communication, education now people, you know, um, showing them that this is wrong, that there are laws now in PNG and we're not living in, you know, past times anymore and we have to stop this. So it's kind of like, um, it's been there, it, it's been practiced for a while. There's been lots of fights over the years, tribal fights. And um, in 2016, there was an SOE that went on to 2017 and then went on to 2018 with the earthquake. And then the, the SOE continued till 2020. So the government has been really trying to address this issue, as well as the police. Um, they, they have been trying, but it's a law and order issue that is still there. And I think it's time that we, you know, see it for what it really is. It isn't a tribal fight. It's a crime. And they're not warlords. They're criminals. Like, we have to start addressing it that way. Does that mean more security forces, more police, more PNGDF personnel needed in that part of the world? Or is, is there a different solution you think might be more effective? I think it would be more better if they started criminalizing it. You see, at the moment when there's a tribal fight, they have peace talks, they do compensations, and then they settle the issue. No one gets arrested. None of them gets, you know, put behind bars, and that's why it continues. It has to be criminalized. You know, we have to start referring to these tribal fights as um, a massacre. That's what it is. They're killing people. They're murderers. They're not warlords. And they need to be um, brought in and they need to be held accountable. They have to be charged and penalised for their actions. Thanks, so, Rebecca. I'll, um, I'll just let people know too, for you watching at home, um, there's an article today on the Low Institute's Interpreter blog written by Leanne Girari uh, about the situation in Hella. Um, and it's um, a pretty good background on where things are at. Um, I'd recommend to read if you get a chance to have a look at that and also to follow Rebecca's work on Facebook, particularly Rebecca's uh, web page is called Becky's World. And she often writes about some of the drivers, some of the social factors that are um, and, you know, behind some of these issues that we see in the Highlands. Um, I might come across back to you, Yuan Bari, because um, ICAC, we mentioned it as having been passed by Parliament just a day before uh, all the political turmoil of late last year. 
What's actually been passed? Are we about to see a new organisation set up in PNG to start um, really tackling corruption? Yeah, I think um, it, uh, it's really important to maybe preface this with the, the, the history of the work behind uh, this institution. Um, as, as your viewers might be aware, um, the Papua New Guinea in perceptions of corruption and most recently in the, in the recent uh, Corruption Perception Index result done by Transparency International Global um, ranks pretty poorly. Um, we, we are the worst in the Pacific. So um, in, in terms of uh, the responses uh, that have been mooted over the years, um, the Independent Commission Against Corruption has been um, something that Transparency National PNG and others have been pursuing for um, almost 20 years, now 25 years. Um, so initial discussions around it happened because of the work that was being done in uh, Asian jurisdictions like Hong Kong, uh, Singapore. Uh, oh, we might have just had a dropout there with Yuan Bari's video. Fingers crossed we can get him back. Um, while that's going on, I might jump across to you, Patrick. I know one of the big issues for us down here in Australia, there's been lots of coverage about it over the last couple of days, is various proposals, various agreements that have been Oh, hang on. John Barry is back. We've got you and Barry back. So sorry, you and Barry, we just lost you there for a sec. We got to where you were telling us about how the legislation had been modelled on Hong Kong and Singapore and other jurisdictions. Would you be able to pick up there and just tell us, you know, what we're going to see in PNG over coming months and years? Sure. I was concerned I might have said something too sensitive there for a moment. <laughs> um, but the, the, the Independent Commission Against Corruption basically is looking at, um, and it alludes to the work that uh, Rebecca is mentioning, there's been a weakness in the integrity system of the country. And in terms of prosecution of corruption cases, um, you have an investigation, the arrest, the charging, the prosecution, these are all done by disparate cons uh, constitutionally mandated uh, bodies. So the vision of the ICAC or the Independent Commission Against Corruption is to consolidate all of that into one agency. Um, so you have a body that has the ability to investigate, arrest, prosecute um, matters of corruption. The bill also does additional um, work like uh, defining what corruption is in law, which aids practitioners to then they charge someone with official acts of corruption. I mean, it also speaks to whistleblower protections for the ICAC itself and speaks to other functions like uh, public awareness on corruption. So it's a wide ranging bill. Um, in terms of the status of it, so it was um, enacted after three parliamentary readings last year. Um, so the bill is now enacted by parliament. Um, it's still waiting a certification process. So that requires the Speaker of Parliament to certify the bill as being uh, a bill that is in effect and a law of Papua New Guinea. Uh, so that's still a pending certification. And then it will be obviously a, a law that's uh, on the books. Um, the component that still needs to be done is where TIPG's focus is at the moment for this year, um, and which the government is also signal and interested in is really the formulation of regulation. Um, so you might have the law that tells you what this ICAC can and can't do, but you really need guiding regulations to specify, particularly on the powers um, of arrest, uh, investigation and prosecution that I mentioned, but also on the independence of the body. Um, so key things like how does the ICAC uh, investigate what are the uh, steps that it will take? How does it identify when is a matter to be investigated or not? Uh, when it decides to arrest, um, does it arrest or does it ask the police to arrest? Um, how does that work? Uh, when they go to prosecution, um, there's specifications in the bill about the office of the public prosecutor, which is a separate constitutional mm -hmm. office. So there have to be protocols in place with existing bodies. So um, your viewers might be aware that the Ombudsman Commission of Papua New Guinea uh, has concerns around how this new constitutional body, the ICAC, will inter play with these existing agencies. So these um, regulations and policies are really vital to ensuring the success of the ICAC. Um, it can't just be the magic bullet, it has to really work within an ecosystem of good governance. Um, so that's what TIPNG and others are looking at this year, um, the oper operationalization of the ICAC. So we yeah. have a bill yes. that's now been enacted in parliament, waiting for certification, and we have about two years of operationalization, so working out regulations, doing the recruitment, um, securing an office, getting a budget. So uh, we had allocation for the ICAC in the 2021 budget last year um, towards the operationalization of the ICAC. So that's where most of the focus will be for uh, 2021 in terms of the procedural matters. But obviously, as uh, Rebecca mentioned, there's always a lot of political uncertainty in Papua New Guinea, and you can uh, be guaranteed that the ICAC will definitely be not immune to the, the, the uncertainty that exists in the country. Yeah, it sounds like yeah. there's a lot of work to do to really get it uh, set up and, and stood up. So just so I understand, I mean, the Ombudsman Commission, I remember when it was established, was sort of held up as a bit of a model for other countries of how to manage these issues um, in political life. So does the OC become part of this new organisation? Does it 
sort of becomes subject to the operation of ICAC? Or is that that's the question that we still have to, I guess, see the answers to? Yeah, I'll, I'll use uh, Patrick's disclaimer of not being a legal expert to be able to uh, comment on constitutional <laughs> matters, but but I, but I will say that the, the functions and the roles of the Ombudsman Commission um, have to be captured in these regulations as to how they work with the ICAC. So if um, they're both entities that are able to do investigations and recommend prosecution to the Office of the Public Prosecutor, then there have to be um, regulations in place in the ICAC that speak to the existing regulations and the existing processes that are there within the Ombudsman Commission. Um, from TIPNG's point of view, we've always seen the Ombudsman Commission as a key actor within this role, but that its mandate is much broader than just anti-corruption work. Um, in the early um, pre-independence days, the, the Ombudsman Commission was proposed as a, along the models of the Scandinavian Ombudsman, which is a public protector, ensuring that public services delivered. Um, they have a wide ambit of powers just beyond the leadership code and the anti-corruption work. For instance, they also have uh, a mandate to request public information. So freedom of information documents is also something that falls within the role of the Ombudsman Commission and is a power that uh, TIPNG would like to see more used. So definitely they still have a lot of work to do. It's not uh, just one game, the anti-corruption game. There's still a lot of work to be done by all these partners. And this is why regulations are important. They really need to ensure that new uh, legislative processes like whistleblowing, which also happened last year, um, needs to be within the existing framework of anti-corruption work in Papua New Guinea. Yuanbari, thanks for that. And for anyone who's interested to keep um, tabs on what's going on, I can really recommend following TIPNG's Facebook page. Um, lots of their work is published there regularly, um, including the recent launch of that uh, you know, Global Corruption Index and um, its rankings for PNG. So um, if you're not already following that page, I can highly recommend it. Patrick, I had started to ask you in that small technical dropout we had there about, um, well, I guess... Western province is suddenly really prominent for a lot of us here in Australia. People are talking about agreements that have been made between um, the Western provincial government and uh, a Chinese company for fisheries. There's also been in the last couple of days reports of a massive project, allegedly $38 billion worth of spending on um, on Daru for a new city, which I know PNG's government has said it doesn't really know anything about and Australia's government has also played down. But can I ask you about the role of these types of agreements in politics in PNG? Memorandums of understanding, um, I guess business deals, they seem to be a lot of them. Do they lead to much and what role do they play in the political system in PNG? I guess, uh... Western province is uh, one of the most neglected uh, provinces in, uh, in Papua New Guinea and uh, politicians, the Chinese, they deal with our political leaders. They go straight to the top and you know, convincing them about the uh, benefits of engaging with them in commercial enterprise. So that's not uh, a secret. You know? uh, so political leaders usually have the last say in signing up to agreements. Uh, I think one of the frustrating things about uh, maybe I'm reading this on the social media as well is the, the way it is a more an Australian Australian centric kind of way of looking at the project as being very geo strategically not in Australia's interest and how it is framed you know PNG is framed as a doorstep of a backyard when you know PNG is a sovereign independent state and it's going into agreement with another sovereign independent state in China for example so. Yeah, we, we are, these kinds of language may perhaps not be very good in when you're framing a, a something that is done between two countries. Uh, Papua New Guinea may want to benefit out of it, but the, the thing that perhaps Australian officials may want to uh, uh, with Papua New Guinea is to get Papua New Guinea to actually get take ownership of the project instead of uh, giving it to the Chinese to manage and uh, you know, so it, it's always a win-win situation if uh, Papua New Guinea is uh, perhaps uh, made to benefit out of the, and maximize out of uh, uh, its interest out of this particular project. Uh, so, so political leaders will have their say and uh, people will, uh, you know, Papua New Guinean uh, citizens in Western province felt neglected for decades since independence when something of this nature turns up uh, perhaps the, 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 the motivation to uh, just agree to it will, will be there. But how Papua New Guinea uh, takes full ownership of it instead of you know, questionable Chinese uh, influence and presence and management, I think that's where 
Australia and Papua New Guinea can agree on. Mm. But Papua New Guinea takes ownership of it instead of uh, being a Chinese-led uh, initiative. Rebecca, can I ask you, I mean, you're covering national affairs day to day. Is it the sort of thing that's getting a lot of, I guess, traction? Are people talking about it in Port Moresby, um, you know, in journalistic political circles? Not really. It's not a, um, a topic here in uh, Port Moresby. A lot of people are talking about it. Um, yeah, I think it's more from Australia's point of view. It, it isn't geographically um, the right place for Chinese to build quickly and manage. So um, for PNG, there's, it's not really a topic. There's not much concern about it. Um, but I did see on social media, there was um, people from Daru expressing concern because um, in PNG, there are a lot of customary landowners. And so they're concerned about the land and all that. So there's just been concerns about how Chinese is going to acquire the land because the land in PNG is mostly owned by locals. Thanks, Rebecca. Now, just a reminder to you at home, if you're watching today's event, you can send in a question yourself if you'd like to ask one of our panellists something. Um, you do that at the bottom of your screen, click the Q&A button, type in your question, and we'll be coming to those shortly. Um, something I would love to get each of you, just if you feel um, you can, is talk about the legacy of Sir Makeri Marata, um, who passed away just before Christmas. And it did seem to bring a lot of focus to the role of government and the role of policy in driving what government does. Yon Barry, do you get a sense that there is an appetite in the community to have some of those bigger questions looked at again about, you know, the role of government and what government does in terms of things like state-owned enterprises, things like um, uh, the way that the central bank is regulating things? What, what was your sense and your as you watched the response of that in January this year. Yeah, so um, for viewers, Sir Makari was one of the um, Prime Ministers of Papua New Guinea, and one, of, one was identified with a lot of public service reforms. Um, for us in uh, Transparency International, I guess the biggest uh, legacy that uh, he left that we're still looking at improving is the organic law and the integrity of political parties and candidates. So that's the OLIPAC, um, which is a can uh, which are uh, policy, which is a legislation that looks at in in, um, increasing uh, party affiliation and ensuring that there's party voting, um, also the integrity of party politics in Papua New Guinea, which speaks to some of the issues that uh, Patrick mentioned earlier about the, the unpredictability of Papua New Guinean politics. The, the party political mechanism is not as strong as we would like to see. And the constitutional offices that were um, enacted uh, after Sir Macari's, um intervention on the OLIPAC uh, legislation, uh, like the independent uh, uh, um, office of the uh, part parties and candidates, um, so looking at that work and that legacy, um, it also, I guess, uh, prompts the question of what is the next generation doing? Where, where are the next people like Semeker in government um, pursuing reforms and willing to use their political clout to um, look at agendas that might be very difficult? Um, we have Bougainville um, with the recent uh, outcome of the dialogue in, uh, in Buka and what, what the future that might be and how the discussions are on decentralization in the country. Um, there's still uh, a very much a need for reform um, and also a need to continue and build on some of the other um, uh, reforms that were introduced by Semeker in his time. Um, so it's really um, a point of reflection, but also looking at uh, the credibility of decision making and leadership and, and uh, I guess the politics of Papua New Guinea uh, in light of uh, Semeker's passing. That's um, a really good point. I think I might take the opportunity to dive into some of the questions because I can see come, some, some are coming through already. And there's one that sort of relates to this that I can see Patrick has seen, and it's from Johnson Ahupa, uh, who asks, there are MPs who jump camps. How do you explain the manoeuvring between political parties in PNG? There's been a lot of it in the aftermath of what happened late last year. So Patrick, I might come to you first in response to that, you know, what, what drives that movement? And then um, I might come back to you as well, Yuan Barry, about what happens next with Olipak. The personality politics is very, uh, very strong on the floor of parliament. The political parties have, are created around very influential dominant personalities. Uh, in Westminster parliamentary systems, the party is 
galvanized together by ideology. The Papua New Guinea, there is nothing ideological, ideological about political parties. So it's just easily defragmented. Uh, it can fragment at any time. Uh, so the movement on the floor of parliament in that uh, November uh, sitting was very much uh, reflective of that. Uh, so uh, Sam Basil, uh, uh, I mean, Patrick Dwight's moving across to the opposition and a large bulk of his uh, membership of NA was in the government. So there, there is really a, a personality-driven kind of uh, you know, movement on the floor of parliament. I, I comment mostly that there's no such thing as a political party system in Papua New Guinea. Uh, we think, we seem to think that there's a political party system, but it's not. Uh, political parties are basically factions. We, they're factions of convenience on the floor of parliament. They can easily splinter or rebrand or, you know, say, Sam Basil himself is uh, somebody who's been jumping around from party to party. There's a word they're using on social media called political prostitute to refer to people who jump from space to space, or political parties to political parties. They rebrand themselves, but there's nothing really reflective of a political party system. And until we get the political party system in order, uh, governed by ideology and party discipline and force, uh, perhaps there'll be some predictability on the floor of parliament, members voting according to party resolutions and so on and so forth. I think party politics is perhaps the, the, the thing that does not create predictably. So you and Barry, the, um, the reform of Olipak responding to the, the um, Supreme Court's ruling that it effectively invalidated it. I mean, the, the attempt in the past was to kind of lock politicians in and make parties, you know, a restrictive part of the political system in PNG. Do you think that's where reform might head again, just looking for a different legal solution to that? Or do you think, um, you know, what, what happens next with Olipak will be a little less restrictive? Yeah, so there's um, a, a bill that has been gazetted uh, as of end of last year, I think in December of 2020, um, with about 40, 44 amendments to the organic law. Um, so it will be similar to the ICAC process where we will have to have three readings in parliament and there'll be two votes on the second reading and on the third reading. Um, so that's the process to put through the amendments. Um, I haven't had time to look at the, the legal implications and whether it remedies and the issues that were pointed up by the, the um, Supreme Court in their decision. Um, but it's obviously something that we would like to see. Political parties um, are, are a key means of ensuring accountability. Um, so in, in Papua New Guinea, if you can't have that accountability of the person that you've elected, you lose mm -hmm. your basic uh, mechanism of ensuring that your views are represented in parliament um, and will be elected. So you will often see in Papua New Guinea, uh, to Mr. Taiko's point, um, there's often uh, 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 no evidence-based policy making because you're not judged on the impact of your uh, legislative prowess, let's say. Um, it's really about uh, the clientelism that you can get with the public funds that are at your disposal, um, which is not really how parties are supposed to operate. It's not about securing the biggest cut of the, of the pipe for your electorate. Um, it's more about the legislative reform, which you would like to pursue um, to, to reflect on, I guess, uh, uh, ideal and uh, how to push through those reforms. You really do need a strong political party system to be able to, to master the, the, the votes on, on the floor of parliament. Um, moving beyond, I guess, the, the organic law and the integrity of political parties and candidates, which um, have now been gazetted and the amendments will be, need to be looked at. Um, there's also the reforms around the electoral process. Oh, and I think we've just seen that that button's been pressed again on you and Barry. He's obviously said something that he's not supposed to be talking about. The, the internet has expired. Oh, no, we're back. You and Barry, we had that problem again where you said something about <laughs> political party reform and suddenly you were gone again. <laughs> Do you want to pick up yeah, on that? I, I, I probably should have <laughs> be mindful of my words. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, just thing aside, I was just mentioning about the electoral reforms, which go... Um, in, in, in parallel with the party reforms. So we, uh, we also had the government in 2019 comments a review of the electoral processes and as viewers will be able to 2022 elections are coming up. So it's highly unlikely that there'll be electoral reform this year, although stranger things have happened. Um, but that's also a parallel process that we're looking at. So on one track, we have the political parties and also the electoral reforms that are being introduced. One would hope to ensure that there's uh, better elections and also better um, politicking in the floor of parliament. 
Great. Thanks, Your Barry. And something I'm just going to flag, hopefully we'll get time, I'd like to come back and talk to you about freedom of information as well. Um, yeah. I'll go to another question. This one's from Amanda Ellis, and she says, PNG is one of the, late, the last great biodiversity hotspots on the planet. Is conservation on the political agenda at all? Rebecca, can I come to you on that one? Um, conservation environment, um, I know it's a big factor at the moment in Morabi province, people talking about um, a proposed mine there. What do you think? Does it get a lot of attention in the national conversation? So oh, we may have a problem with Rebecca's connection there as well. So I will leave that. Oh, no, hang on. I think we've got you back, Rebecca. Can I hear you? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I'll let Yon Barry answer this. Oh. I think he, yeah. <laughs> that's a, that's a very good, very deftly done. All right, Yon Barry. Conservation yeah. environmental issues. Where do they rank in terms of what people are talking about in national affairs? Look, so it, this comes again back to the point of uh, legitimacy and decision making. Um, so ensuring that the electorate's views are represented as the policy-making uh, decision. And I, not, not to tick all my boxes in this conversation, but it also goes back to freedom of information, uh, which I alluded to earlier, um, which is still a law that uh, TIPNG would like to see and which we're working um, with government to try and develop. But if you have this access to the information around the environmental impact assessments and ensure that there was a democratic process in the decision-making, then you would have more of a preservation of people's priorities, which in this case would be the environment, their well-being, the ability to sustain themselves. Um, you know, with a country of 80% rural majority, you would want to ensure that people's livelihoods are not impacted by um, budgetary con considerations. Um, that, that would be the ideal, and that's the constitutional ideal that uh, Transparency International uh, uh, would like to see in these processes. Um, we released a report in 2018, looking at the mining licensing process in the country. And one of the key factors that we, we identified as being an underlying issue is the lack of proper public consultation with women, with children, with people that actually use the land and ensuring that these community groups that validate policy decisions um, are able to actually have those um, concerns of theirs and you know, uh, addressed by the government. Um, and then to just circle back all the way to the initial question about China and the concerns around that uh, business decision. Um, again, this is a really a freedom of information issue. Um, when the correspondence was first received by the government of Papua New Guinea, this was in 2020, we should have had this publicly available, there should have been discourse around it, the benefits, the, the, the risks that are involved, we would have seen in the 2021 national budget. So all these things are very much um, part of our whole, uh, and they're really looking at issues of legitimacy and process uh, in country. Um, if we have people's priorities, which are obviously environmental, um, prioritized, then there would be a different discourse happening. But if you don't have those mechanisms of accountability on both the parliamentarians and the actors of information by citizens, and then it becomes really difficult to have uh, a democracy. And if I can put it that way. Yeah. John Barry, thanks for that. I'll jump across to Patrick on this too, because I, I sort of reference what's going on in Morabi province at the moment. And just for background, um, there's the proposed Wifi Golpu uh, gold mine outside um, Lay in Morabi province. And there's been a, a big dispute evolving between the national government and the provincial government about some of the environmental conditions for that project. Okay. Patrick, it, it looks like there is a really big split emerging there between the national government and the provincial government. Um, and there's a party dimension to it as well. Does that sort of suggest that there are some strengths starting to develop in the way political parties might align themselves around some of these issues? Uh, Morocco province, I think the, the landowners, uh, to their credit, they uh, somehow have been uh, made aware of the implications of this and this local grassroots mobilization of uh, the environmental impact of pumping all this uh, mine waste from the Wafi Golpu. Wafi Golpu sits in the interior of the Morocco province and all the, the waste will be shipped down to the uh, the sea floor in the coastal part of the Morabe province. So, to the credit of uh, local NGOs and more of educated Morabe and peoples, they are creating awareness about uh, the likely environmental impact of this. So, the, so the, the the grassroots level is pushing actually their governor to act on you know listening to the to the sentiments of Morabian uh, peoples. Uh, 
in terms of the politics, I was reading last night that, uh, in fact, at the breakfast uh, event, uh, James Marape, the Prime Minister, uh, has given uh, an indication that the Wafi Gold Pool project will go ahead as, uh, as planned. Uh, uh, I'm assuming that they are going to resolve somehow, and I think uh, James Marape has signaled that, uh, that they won't perhaps be entertaining too much uh, the, the deep sea tailing that uh, was proposed earlier. So how that was going to be, uh, that's going to be uh, uh, created or uh, uh, made, uh, I, I, I'm not aware of it yet. They, they, uh, James Marape, I think, has given the indication that they'll, they will not entertain perhaps the deep sea tailing of the uh, idea that they initially uh, were proposing. Mm -hmm. That is definitely one for our things to watch in 2021 list. Uh, so thanks for that, Patrick. I'll go to another question now from those of you watching remotely. Um, this one is from Francis Wagaray, uh, who asks, could the presenters comment on social media's impact on information in PNG? Does it help keep tabs on government and public power? Um, and also, is fake news an issue? And maybe, Rebecca, this might be one we can lob at you in the first instance. Um, how big a factor is social media? And you, you sort of exist in both worlds. You're reporting for the mainstream press, but you've also um, built quite a following on social media. What do you think it's doing and how is it a factor in um, current affairs in PNG? Um, social media has played a really big role. Um, it's changed the way things are done in PNG, comparing... Um, PNG, like from five years ago to now, we have more um, people actually taking part in decision making. Uh, for example, the the political impasse last year, there were there was um, public opinion on social media, and people were actually holding their members of parliament accountable. You know, they were asking MPs, "Why are you still on this side? Or why are you crossing over? Like, tell us why you're still there. Why you're moving so." Um, it's great to see that through social media, people are able to now take part in um, decision making. And there's, there's just been like so many information out there. People have access to information, which is very important. They are able to form their own opinions based on this um, information. And they are able to hold their leaders accountable. So social media um, has played a really big uh, role in almost everything that has happened recently, including the political impasse, the COVID-19 thing. Um, there are risks involved, like for every post information that's put up, there's like five fake news on the other side of it. But yeah, social media has really changed the way things are done in PNG. Yohan Bari, can I come to you on this? I mean, the, the, the role of social media in bringing scrutiny to government, are you seeing changes? Are you think, do you think there is a greater demand as a result of people having access to these technologies? Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, it's filling a, a gap in terms of legislation in the country. Um, we don't have, we have a constitutional right to access information, but no enabling laws on the books. That means if I write to the Department of um, uh, environment and conservation to ask what the environmental impact assessment was for Morobe. They are under no obligation to provide it to me unless I'm locally impacted. Um, so th there's been a, a dearth of legislation which has led to a vacuum which social media has neatly filled, but there's still that issue of legitimacy. So I, in, this, in this case, the legitimacy of the information and the, the motives behind providing it and this issue of what is the true evidentiary basis for any policy that's coming out and is it based on anything that's actually publicly available and that's been scrutinized or independently sourced? Um, there's, there's really lack of public data collection and a lot of people working in um, the development space in the country and practitioners, public servants just don't have access to reliable data to make information, um, informed decisions, I should say. And that again speaks to the issue of there's no um, pressure um, being exerted to make sure that we have policies that are informed uh, on, on, on sound data. So it's, it's really a half and half um, yes, it's it's really good to have social media there, um, but we still need to have that core backbone of um, ICT infrastructure, which I know has become really politicized in government recently between the geopolitical players that are out there. But it's still something that Papua New Guinea really needs the, the basic primary data to be able to make um, um, valid decisions. And this is something that uh, we would like to see 
Um, really, we need, we, need, we need a law um, for freedom of information in the country, and that will empower journalists, academics, NGOs to be able to partake in this process on at least an equal footing with government. At the moment, we just happen to know about these things if they come out and if they're politically advantageous to the person that's leaking the information. Um, in last year, at the beginning of the year, we were all up in arms over the Paladin scandal in Manus. Uh, and that information was leaked out and now it's just tied up because there's been no subsequent follow-up information. So yeah, social media is useful. It gets the, the fire going, but it, it can't sustain it and it can't sustain a democracy. You really need to have that underlying process and uh, legislation in place. Patrick, are you seeing the way that political players, I guess leaders and parties are using social media? Are you seeing it change? Are you seeing um, the way that it interacts with the political system becoming a bigger factor? Uh, I don't necessarily see it from where I am. Uh, these are episodic periods in which uh, Facebook or Facebook is, of course, the most popular form of uh, social media platform. Uh, of course, there are seventy. I'm trying to pick up. Uh, there are seven hundred and seventy-two thousand uh, current users of Facebook. They estimated from the Internet World Stats and in PNG currently. Uh, that is still a very low percentage of uh, uh, users in terms of uh, having a, the, the critical mass of people who will have a direct impact on politics. Uh, and we also have a very, in Papua New Guinea, the basic uh, infrastructure of collecting public opinion, uh, measuring public opinion as a re reaction to you know, things that people read online or through social media platforms. That is inexistent. So how do we actually, as going back to Mr. Yuan uh, uh comment, uh, how do you translate the social media, the use of political messaging on social media platforms into actual uh, action, influencing legislation and voting behavior? Uh, because all the other uh, uh, structures of uh, you know, public information is, is missing, like uh, public opinion uh, collection and understanding but issues matter to voters and to citizens and so on and so forth. But I think that's basically where I see the missing link uh, with uh, the rolling out of the internet and as more Papua New Guineans become more media literate and uh, understanding the role of social media in uh, our globalized society, uh, perhaps we, we can see, uh, we, might, we might see uh, something different and how it directly impacts our politics. But uh, some of the recent incidents like a 2011 political impasse and uh, 2016 student unrest and uh, last year's uh, political maneuvering. Uh, social media also played a part in lessening, uh, you know, physical confrontation. Citizens would rather sit back and contribute ideas and mobilize online rather than physically tending to protest. Uh, it would be a much more dangerous uh, thing for citizens. So I, a change of ideas is important online, but there's a disconnect between how it's actually uh, uh, in this, uh, mobilized into political action outside of social media. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll go to another question now. This one's from Lydia Dimakari uh, with a question for Rebecca. So back to you, Rebecca. Um, be being in the political space, reporting on national issues, being a woman taking on a challenging yet exciting role, what have been your challenges in journalism and how can we, the audience, encourage women like you to take on this job of reporting on national issues. Um, she also gives the example of Leanne Girari. Is politics and leadership a dangerous playing field for women in PNG? Um, yeah, I think I think it's um, it is sometimes very challenging, um, but it, it's also a rewarding um, journey so far uh, to be able to be out there and um, to see things with more empathy and. Yeah, um, yeah, it's it, it's been great. Yeah. Um, but there's there's challenges um, involved because PNG is a a country where men are, you know, leaders and women aren't supposed to speak and all that. But we're breaking traditions and we're coming out and women now have a voice and yeah. Good on you, Rebecca. I think that's a great response. And hopefully, you know, through supporting your work um, as a reader and as a follower on social media, if people are interested, we will um, send an email out after today's events with a few links to things that we've discussed. And we'll make sure there's a link to 
Rebecca's page there as well that you can follow along at. Um, I'll go to another question now. This one's from Elizabeth Brennan, and I might send this one to you first, Patrick. It seems that district support grants, DSIP, are now firmly embedded in the operations of politicians, and it's attracted questions about how well that money is being spent. Do you get the sense that district support grants are likely to continue? And if not, what would drive a change? District support, uh, support grants uh, seem to be the permanent picture of uh, prime ministers uh, holding on to the loyalty of their backbenchers and uh, members. So I don't think that it will go away in any time soon. Uh, the use of the district service improvement program, um, that's the, from the district uh, component of it. The provincial is known as the provincial um, support improvement program, PSIP. Provincial Support Improvement Program. So that, uh, for the governors, they receive the PSIP and the open members, they receive the DSIP. Uh, 10 million kina annually is very unrealistic for an open member of parliament to be implementing projects. If you do an actual costing of what an electorate will need, it will not be 10 million kina. At the cost of uh, infrastructure development alone would be in uh, the hundreds of millions of kina. Uh, so perhaps the the challenge is going back to uh, the public service and the finance uh, department, uh, treasury and department of national planning to try to educate our lawmakers, politicians, people who go into parliament to look at how the options, uh, instead of relying on the DSIP as the only source of revenue and the only motivation to be in government or to support the prime minister. So I, I talk with a lot of uh, my students and also for communities in, the, in Papua New Guinea, and, you know, they always you know, look forward to the 10 million in allocation that is guaranteed to the open members of parliament. And I, I tell them that uh, 10 million kina is, is not enough if you're trying to implement a project. Uh, you have to start raise money for yourself. There are a very good example. Uh, Rabaul MP, Dr. Alan Marat, has been in the opposition for almost three terms of parliament now. But he's able to generate uh, income through you know, a business arm of the Rabaul uh, Development Authority. So they're making money outside of the normal structure of the DSIP that is given to fund their own projects and uh, the administration of their district in the rubble district. So MPs have to uh, perhaps go beyond the idea of DSIP as the only source of uh, revenue for the district. I think this will take a lot of uh, cultural change and uh, uh, education on the part of uh, citizens as well. Thanks, Patrick. Um, Johan Barry, is this something that TI has um, had anything to say about, about DSIPs and whether you know that's the model that PNG should be pursuing? Yeah, look. Ideally, in a, 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 an effective governance system, you would want the decision makers not to also be the ones that spend the money. Um, you would like to have those two functions separate and this discretionary funds, um, I think it's actually secretly and uh, maybe sometimes publicly, it's something that's been a, 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 a curse for M MPs because it ends up uh, re, re um, emphasizing their role as service deliverers in the country. Um, I've had conversations with members of the parliament where they've secretly come and said, you know, people expect me to contribute for this and contribute for that. And I think a fair few of them, you know, if there was a politically savvy move out there, would want to get rid of the DSIP and just give it back to the role of public administrators and provincial uh, administrators rather than carry the burden of, you know, being the ones that have to dish out the money. Um, 10 million kina sounds like a lot to me, Patrick, but uh, I think it would be better if they had like these evidence-based uh, approaches to actually dishing out the money um, based on the priorities uh, that have been, again, as assessed from the data that's been uh, collected. But yeah, I think uh, ideally we would want to see a system where you have, if you do give money to people that actually make decisions on the budget, then you should really have high standards of accountability and proper audits of um, how the money is spent. But failing that, the best thing would be to go and legislate and take out the ability for members of parliament to have discretionary funds that they can use. Um, I, I think uh, it's been something that's uh, mired Papua New Guinean politics or uh, you know, delayed the ability for members of parliament to actually focus on the primary constitutional role of legislating um, rather than uh, national development through services and projects. I, I'd also like to make a point that we still have a parliament that has 
Uh, the but look, this button is getting you and Barry. It's got you again, you and Barry. It just cut you off as you were about to say something again. I, I, I was just speaking about the lack of women in parliament and saying that the, we have to bear in mind that the composition of parliament is really um, undemocratic, shall I say, if we have 100% men and almost all of them have uh, private business interests prior to entering politics, uh, apart from the good member from Rabal, I, I assume. Um, so, yeah, if you look at the interests that they are serving and, the, and the, the, the skills that they have, unfortunately, it looks that they're able to generate, you know, revenue and use it to spend on services because they happen to be businessmen. Oh, see there, it's, it's cut you and Barry off again. So clearly, um, <laughs> <laughs> we've lost you again, you and Barry. And um, politics, so they enter the, the rail. Oh, we've got you back just to finish that off. That's good. I don't, you know, I don't know what's going on at the TI office there. We better watch <laughs> out for that one for future events. Um, look, we're very close to time. I thought I might just very quickly, because one of the big contrasts between PNG and Australia this year is our different experiences of the pandemic and, and the impact that it's having on our lives. Obviously, here in Australia, it's been quite disruptive, but some... Um, pretty uh, intense measures by the governments here have kept numbers fairly low. PNG has had a, a number of cases. Um, I know that there are concerns about the level of testing, but I was just very keen, perhaps for a personal observation for our panellists, just the impact it's had on each of your lives. And perhaps, Rebecca, can I come to you? You're, you've got the mask on there in the newsroom today, obviously. Um, where does COVID sit? Where, what impact is it having on your lives and the people around you? And, and what do you think the prospects are for the year ahead? Um, currently we have about 900 case, I mean, the total cases for PNG so far is 900, and that's been nine deaths so far. Um, uh, there's lack of communication when it comes to COVID-19. We really don't, there's lack of information that we really don't know what's happening. Um, they just send us press statements, and, um, it's been going on for a couple of months now. It's, um, at the end, um, at the, um, Last year in March, when COVID first came to PNG, and we had we had SOEs and we had um, lockdowns, and that really had a really huge impact on PNG. Um, we have a lot of um, businesses shutting down. We a lot of people lost their jobs, and there's still a lot of jobs. So um, the economic impact has been really severe for PNG. Um, PNG is slowly building itself up again. The COVID restrictions have been um, relaxed a bit, but still there is a um, communication breakdown between um, the authorities, COVID-19 authorities and local media. Right. So Thanks, currently, I don't know how many active cases we have in PNG. I just know that so far there has been 900 cases and they haven't told us yet how many out of this 900 are active cases. So yeah, that's COVID-19. Patrick, I know the academic year has just started at UPNG. Is it disruptive? Is it, you know, is it a factor when you're dealing with students coming on onto the campus the first time? We had a very uh, extended uh, year of uh, university studies last year, going well into November and early December. So it really affected the uh, delivery of uh, our subjects and courses, our lectures. Uh, we had to go online. Uh, in fact, COVID-19 exposed some of the deficiencies with uh, our investing in the internet technology here at the university. Uh, and therefore, people are now operating for Zoom. Uh, through Zoom, we have to create a virtual learning uh, platforms. Uh, and of course, students also unable to uh, purchase uh, handsets and laptops. So uh, at the university level, uh, I think COVID-19 exposed uh, serious uh, kind of areas for us to start investing in. Uh, my own personal observation, I think we have come to a stage uh, as Papua New Guinea, uh, COVID fatigue, I believe. Uh, the, the, the mention of the mere mention of the word uh, COVID uh, perhaps just creates, you know, people are just trying to look at a post COVID-19 uh, you know, setting scenario. Um, that's why I think there's a lot of complacency, you know, faceless, uh, uh, maskless faces entering shops. Uh, perhaps in uh, Port Mosby, you know, there are restrictions, but into going into the places like uh, Kimbe in the Western Britain province, totally uh, chaotic. People don't know what COVID-19 is. So there's misinformation coupled together with COVID fatigue. 
Uh, the misperception here in Kenya is that COVID-19 will not, uh, you know, affect Papua New Guineans, Melanesians. It's only, you know, Western industrialized countries will be affected by COVID-19. So all these different kinds of uh, misconceptions, they really fall into, uh, you know, they are factored in as well when they're trying to deal with uh, the awareness and vaccination also. Yeah, Patrick, thanks for that. COVID fatigue, you and Barry, everyone a bit tired of it over your way. Um, what, what do you think the year ahead holds for PNG dealing with the pandemic? Yeah, I think for, for civil society organisations in Papua New Guinea, COVID-19 is, um, I guess, doubly difficult. So first, it affects the ability for proper consultation um, because uh, government has reduced the ability of consultation, sticking consent of the government, um, ensuring that people are aware of processes because of the limits on how many people can congregate, that's been an issue. So it's something that we would like to maybe, us personally, looking at more engagement with people and ability to travel and to have meetings and discussions um, around some of these issues of governance. I think, and also just zooming out a, a bit, the, the pandemic act that was passed last year in response to the COVID-19 crisis is still very much on, on, the, on the table. And we currently are in an uh, unended uh, declared state of emergency as per the pandemic act. So that's always a wild card that's out there, particularly bearing in mind that the national elections will be happening next year. And one would assume that COVID-19 will still be, um, even though we're fatigued this year, would still be an ongoing discussion next year. And it's something of concern, both the local instances of consultation um, by civil society, but also the wider governance implications of having proper elections and ensuring that people are out there able to um, express their views. Yuan Bari, thank you. And thank and you to all of our panellists. Um, I'm going to be very strict with the time here at the Lowy Institute. If there's one thing we do, we're very sticklers for time. So, uh, Rebecca, Yuan Bari and Patrick, thanks to each of you for being with us today. I really appreciate your time. It's a big commitment. And the technology has served us pretty well. I think there's the four of us. G'day to all of you. Um, thanks to you watching remotely. We hope you've enjoyed this discussion, the latest in our AusPNG Network events program. Um, our sponsors for the event program are BSP, Bank South Pacific and Coca-Cola Amatil. Thanks to both of them. Uh, the Australia PNG Network project gets funding and support from Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Thank you also to my colleagues here at the Lowy Institute who've made this possible. My appreciation and look out for an email for us shortly from us shortly with some details of the things we've talked about today. And we'll see you soon for the next AusPNG Network live event. Have a great day.